Welcome to Emble ABR's second uh, webinar, which will be about Bioconda and the Conda Package Manager. My name is Jeff Christensen, and I'm from Emble Australia Bioinformatics Resource, or Emble ABR for short, and I'll be your host for today. My colleague Susanna Sabine from ARDC, which was formerly Anne's Nectar RDS, and Christina Hall from Emble ABR are behind the scenes co hosting this webinar with me. Emble ABR is a distributed national research infrastructure network providing bioinformatics support to life science researchers in Australia. It was set up as a collaboration with the uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, that's Emble EBI or just EBI for short, to maximise Australia's bioinformatics capability. We currently have 13 nodes across Australia and each of these nodes undertake or support bioinformatics research around several key areas. And these are data, tools, compute, training, standards, and platforms. So before we get started um, and hear from uh, our speaker in a minute, I'd just like to mention a few housekeeping things. So um, all attendee microphones are muted during the presentation, and we do this just to minimize background noise um, when the speakers are presenting. If you do have a question, please type it into the question uh, box in the uh, GoToWebinar software. It's in the control panel. Um, I'll be looking at the questions and at the end of the presentation, I'll relay these to Tom, our presenter today. Uh, this particular webinar will be recorded and it'll be made available on the Emble ABR YouTube channel and links will be provided to it also from the AIDC website. Um, and we'll notify you by email when these are available. Um, so today we have uh, over 50 people in attendance from across the country and we'll be exploring Bioconda. And Bioconda is the, um, is the most uh, popular and widely used bioinformatics channel for Conda and that Conda is a package um, dependency and environment management tool for any computational language. By adding a tool to the Bioconda ecosystem, it becomes widely available as an installable tool package for various operating systems and hardware and it's stored in a fully supported global repository of bioinformatics tools. So we're gonna to hear today from Tom Cudahy, and he's a bioinformatician from the Queensland Facility for Advanced Bioinformatics, better known as QFAB, as well as the University of Queensland's Research Computing Centre in Brisbane. He's going to give us a summary of Bioconda and Conda, and how he has been using these uh, resources to streamline bioinformatic tool wrapping uh, for use on various systems. So a little bit about Tom, he has over a decade of client-focused IT experience, both from working in IT at the University of Queensland and within private industry. And he specialises in multiple programming languages, including Python, C++, Java, and R, and has a strong background in databases, systems admin, and high-performance computing. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, for Susanna, for organising this. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, around Australia. As Jeff said, my name is Tom Cudahy. I'm a bioinformatician and a software developer at QFAB. And today I'll be talking about Bioconda and the Conda Package Manager. To begin with, we'll discuss Conda and Bioconda in comparison to other package managers. Next, we'll look at how to use Conda from a user's perspective. We'll then go on to look at how to package a tool for Conda or Bioconda. And finally, we'll run through a real life example on how to submit your own tool to Bioconda. So why use Conda to begin with? Well, Conda manages self-contained environments. So this includes the dependencies, libraries, additional software for various tools. And one of the primary reasons one of the primary advantages is that no pseudo rights or no admin rights are required. There currently exists a large ecosystem of pre-compiled packages organized as channels. Um, today we'll be talking about Conda Forge and specifically Bioconda, but there are thousands of channels out there. While Conda which you might have guessed from its name. I apologize for that. Well, you might have guessed from its name, Conda or Anaconda, it did originate with Python. It has since become language agnostic. 
So you can include tools written in C, written in Perl, written in R, or just written in any language. Um, another great advantage is that to create new packages, it's relatively straightforward compared to other methods, requiring at a minimum two files, which we'll talk about later. And a big reason why this might be of interest to bioinformaticians and biology researchers is that it's the supported tool installation method for Galaxy. Um, meaning that if you develop a tool, you can increase its availability to additional users by including it within software um, platforms like Galaxy. What about Brew or Linux Brew, I might hear you say? Well, um, they are essentially separate projects, even though Linux Brew came off Brew. Um, there's no support for versioning, which in today's environment of reproducibility is quite important. Um, and from a personal standpoint, I have found that installations using Brew have been a bit, have had a tendency to break. Um, some of you may be familiar with package managers like apt or yum. You might have used apt-get or yum install. And these are typically used to install system-wide packages. Um, it's quite hard to get these to install packages using non-root or non-privileged installations. And you can only really have one version of a tool installed at a time. Um, you might also have experienced that um, official distributions, uh, they rarely keep up to date with recent versions. And that's because creating packages for these are relatively complex. And especially for researchers, it's needlessly complex. If you've used a HPC, you might be more familiar with modules like LMOD. And these are quite well suited to using the shell environment to manage concurrent versions. Um, a benefit of them is that they can be additive. So you can have multiple modules loaded at once. And this is unlike Condor environments, which we'll talk about later. The downside, however, is that it's not a package manager, i.e. it doesn't handle download or compilation and installation. So while you might be able to write your own module files, as a non-privileged user on HPC, you still need to download and compile tools yourself. And from personal experience, doing that as a non-privileged user is non-trivial. And finally, you might have experience with PIP or virtual and env. Now, both of these tools come with great, work come with Python. They're great for Python packages. They have a large ecosystem of existing packages, but they just aren't suited to non-Python stuff. Um, they will, do have the advantages that they don't need sudo or uh, root access. They can be installed locally, and they do take care of compiling. But again, it's just for Python. And that really is where Conda comes in. So now that hopefully you're all interested in Conda, how do you install it? Um, well, there is two versions. The full version, which is called Anaconda, is more of a full Python environment, and it already has a bunch of packages pre-installed. Um, if this is something you need, that's great, but it's generally not needed. So what we use instead is a stripped down version called Miniconda. And this just installs the Conda package manager in your home directory. Um, and you can find additional installation instructions for your platform at this website. Once it's installed from the command line, you can go Conda dash dash help. And this will give you a quick overview of what commands are available for Conda. Some of the most common ones that I use are Conda create to create a new environment, Conda list to list the packages installed in an environment, 
Conda install to install packages and Conda env list. And this will tell me all of my available environments. So let's go through some of these. Um, the first thing we should do with Conda is to, is to set up the um, default channels. When we have the Anaconda defaults or defaults. We have Conda Forge, which has the common software libraries um, and dependencies. And we have Bioconda. And this is a Conda channel specifically for software targeted at biological sciences. And the way we do that is from the command line, we go Conda config dash dash add channels and then the name of the channel. Now the order that you do this is important. As you can see with the defaults one, it says that it's already in the channels list, so it moves it to the top. Anytime you add a channel, it adds it to the top. So we add the defaults, Conda Forge and Bioconda. And if we have a look at our Conda RC dot file, it has those in reverse order. And that's just the order that Conda will look in for a package when you ask to install it. So let's start and create our own environment. First off, we go Conda create, and then we have some flags. A common one you'll see today is dash dash yes. And we include this specifically in, in this example to skip the confirmation. While you're still getting used to Conda, you may want to not include that. And Conda will just prompt you yes or no before performing certain actions. Another common flag is dash dash name. And here we can, we use that to refer to an environment. With Conda create, the name parameter is the name of the environment we want to create. So if we just put that in, there's no tools included. So it's quite easy to solve the environment. It tells us where it's going to put it. It performs the transactions, and then it tells you how to activate it. Source activate environment name, and then source deactivate to get out of it. So let's try that out. If you, go, if you have a look at the code on the right, we are going to activate the MyTool environment we just created. And you'll see that the prompt now has my tools in brackets to begin with. And this is how Conda indicates which module is active. We then go on to go Conda install. We want to skip confirmation. We want to install the package seek TK. And specifically, we're going to ask for version 1.3. Now, when installing software, you don't have to include a version. If you don't, it will just install the highest available uh, version which uh, your environment can support. Also note that I've skipped dash dash name in Condor install. And when you do that, um, not just for Condor install, but for many other Condor commands, it will perform that action as if you were you were wanting to run that in your currently activated environment. So it's gone through, it's installed it, and it's installed several dependencies for it as well. So we use conda list, again, without dash dash name, and we can see the packages, the versions, and the channels that those packages came from. We can assume that CTK was built with GCC, and that's coming from the default channel. It looks like it's also using Zlib, which is a common library, and we've gotten that from Conda Forge. But because CTK is a bioinformatics tool, it's coming from Bioconda. And because we have this environment active, that tool is now available for us to use. So by running which, 
CTK, the shell will tell us where the binary CTK is that, it, that is within the path. And we can see here that it's within the Miniconda 3 environment, the name of the environment, and then the binary folder. If we do a list, we currently only have CTK as a program installed. You can see above we have two additional packages, but these are libraries, not programs. So they aren't included in the binary folder. This is a very simple environment, but say you're working on a workflow or pipeline, or even just a project, you keep adding more and more tools. And when it's time for publication, what you might want to do is export your Condor environment. So that takes a snapshot of all the tools you have available, their dependencies and their versions. So a simple way to do that is using Condor EMV export, and that will print a YAML declaration. So instead of printing that to the screen, we redirect that to a file. And by printing what's in that file, we can see the YAML definition. Now there's another way to save Condor environments, which is more uh, specific. So using Condor list, we can actually include the URLs where the packages were downloaded from. We can include hashes of the packages, and we can be quite explicit with all of our exports. So by redirecting that to mytool.txt, we can see we have a bunch of additional information. And that might be more appropriate for including with a publication. And the reason we do that is that someone can come along, they can take these files and they could import it onto their own systems. So by going condo create, just like we did at the beginning, we're going to give it another name, my imported tool. And instead of just pressing enter, we include an additional parameter, dash dash file. And this is your exported tool environment. You can see it takes that in, it performs the transaction. We then activate my imported tool. And when we list it, we can see that this new environment has the same libraries, versions, builds, and channels as, this, as the prior my tool environment. Um, one thing to note with Condor environments is that if you're working with a newer version of Condor, these environments stack. They're not additive, they're com they are still completely separate. But if you activate one environment and activate another, when you deactivate, you'll go back into your previous environment. The, the legacy behavior was that any time you did a source deactivate, you would go back to your normal shell. Um, so this is something to keep in mind if you're writing scripts, which are activating and deactivating environments to use different tools. And you can see how this behavior works in this tool snippet. Um, in this shell snippet. So we start with my tool, we activate my imported tool, and you can see that the CTK, which we have access to, is within the my imported tool environment folder. We deactivate that, and instead of going back to our normal shell, we go back into my tool. And again, if we do which CTK, we can see that instead of having the my imported tool, we just have the my tool version. Deactivate that one more time, we're back to a normal shell, and the which CTK shows that there is none available. Um, and that's the basic uses for Condo. So now that we know that, we might want to think about how we might leverage that to include our own tools and it's fairly easy. So Condor at the moment supports packaging for Linux, for Mac, 
and for Windows. Now keep in mind that Bioconda does not support Windows. When writing a recipe, it always consists of a metadata file, install scripts, and these are required for each platform you want to um, have your recipe work on. So as you can see, build.sh would be for Linux and OS X, whereas build.bat is for Windows. And an optional component is dedicated test scripts. Again, a .sh or a .bat for each platform. And we'll talk about that later. So the most important file is probably the metadata file or meta.yaml. Here, I'm going to our CTK recipe. You can see within this recipe, we have a build.sh, our build script, and our meta.yaml. So we're going to cat that. And we can see that straight away, it's setting some variables in Jinya uh, version and a SHA256 hash. Now, setting variables like this makes it quite easy to come in and update these as required because you, you'll see that when we actually get to the definitions, um, for example, for package, the first one down, that contains information or metadata about the package, the name, seekdk, that's static, but the version. And again, we can use the Jinja templating to insert the variable we declared at the beginning. So instead of coming in and changing it multiple times, because it's being used in the URL as well, you just change it at the head, and it's a lot easier to work with. Um, so we go on, we talk about the source. This is the URL where we're going to download the package from. SHA256, that is our hash. And again, that's the variable we had at the start. Our next block is the build. We have number, and this starts at zero. And every time you may update this, for example, version 1.4, we just update the build number. Um, an important section is now the requirements, which we'll go into further detail in a second. We have, a, we have an optional test section, which is how Condra tests to make sure that it installed correctly. And then we include additional metadata in the about section. So the home is the home page. The license, it's an MIT license. And then we have this short summary of what the tool does. Uh, so for further details about the source, Condor actually supports multiple different types of sources. We had a URL before. Here we have an example of URL, not just with a SHA256 hash, with an MD5 and a SHA1. Alternatively, you can use um, SVMs like Git or Mercury and include the URLs. Um, and then you can include revisions or tags to say which specific one you want. It is, it is frowned upon, it's generally not allowed to use Git or Mercury or any SVM in Bioconda because um, they are they tend to change. So by having a URL, and this could be a like a Git release URL, um, it's more static and more consistent. The requirements, this has three sections. So the build section is generally the higher level dependencies for building. Um, within newer versions of Conda Builds, version three, it also includes new compiler um, Jinja templates. So we can see in this example, it's using um, the C compiler. And now the nifty thing about this is that it will take it will take the C compiler for Linux. It'll use um, LLVM for Mac OS and 
as well, it will include various libraries into the run dependencies. So in this case, it would be libc. And that, that way you don't have to manually put that in, which is really neat. The host section, this is where you put in platform specific dependencies for building. Um, so this would be cross-link libraries, for example. And a simple way to look at this is that if you're using the compiler templates, you include all non-build dependencies. And finally, the run section includes um, the dependencies you need to actually run the program. So here in CTK, we know it's going to be compiled using C and that while compiling um, for the host and while running it, you also need sedlib. And we saw that before when we installed it. In the test section, there are several ways to do this. Um, for example, with a commands directive, you can have a list of various commands which will be put to the test environment. And these will have to be run with an exit code of zero or return with no errors. So you can see here um, in the example, they're running um, the tool that's been installed, dash H for help. And they're just making sure that this is returning um, successfully. If you're writing a package recipe for a Python library, for example, instead of a command, you can just go imports. And this will make sure that the environment Python is able to import that library. Um, you can also include files in your recipes directory. Um, and if listed in the recipe files section, you can, they will be copied to the test directory. These may be used, um, you may use these for small data sets. You may have a known good output, for example, and then you can use this to compare results with the package tool. This is quite useful, um, but Bioconda is generally against using source files as it tends to bloat for recipe repository. And finally, the about section. Um, so again, it's just the home page. We have the license and that's the type of license. If the extracted um, downloaded file contains a license file, you put in the name of the file in the license underscore file. And I'll actually will copy that to the output directory. Um, and then the, finally the summary which is what the tool does. We have the build scripts, build sh or build bat. Again, Linux and OS X is build sh, while Windows is build that. And within these, you have special variables, prefix, package name, CPU count, e g. And you use these to actually um, customize the installation. The prefix one is important because you'll use this to take the build output and move it to the final destination. You can customize um, output using the package name. I've written a couple where you might want to optimize the tool itself for CPU count. And so by using CPU count, um, it will make sure you're not asking for 16 cores on a four core system for example. Now, um, build dependencies are already in place in the final output. And so when we, before we try to build something, we, if we have any libraries we depend on, which as we saw before, um, was Zlib, and we'll probably need libc as well. We can export these to the build environment um, so we have C underscore include path. We're using prefix and then include. We can do the same with the library path. And that way, when we call make, the compiler knows where to look for these libraries. Um, we make sure that the binary directory exists with make do a dash p. And then we copy ctk, which is the build output, to the binary folder. 
So the optional test scripts, um, run test.sh, run test.bat, again, for Linux, Unix, Windows. And this is used for testing beyond what is capable within meta.yaml. Um, if you're writing a shell script, make sure to set pipe failure so that on any failure of any command within the script, it will cause a fail. And you just need to make sure that it returns an exit code of zero to pass or non-zero if there's an error. So now that we've looked at how to write a Conda recipe, why should we use BioConda as the channel? Well, simply put, it really is the largest channel for prepackaged bioinformatics software. As of yesterday, there's over 4,000 recipes, over 450 contributors. Um, there is a standardized environment, and this aids reproducibility. Um, as we talked about before, we can actually export these environments and these can be installed elsewhere. And these exported environments include the channel. If you're using software written by a smaller channel, there is a chance that they may delete it or may no longer be available or that the way that they wrote the recipe is broken on future operating systems. And so by using Bioconda, we ensure that this the way that recipes are written is consistent and is reproducible in the future. Um, quality control, again, we have recipes, we have um, various Docker images as well for testing. They're using a circle CI for continuous integration and any pull requests, especially by new members are reviewed by the core team. Um, but why should you write your, pack, your tool and patch it to Conda, Bioconda. To be vain, one of the reasons is exposure. We we're talking about CTK before. So if we actually search CTK, there's three channels that have it. Bioconda version 1.3, there's 21 and a half thousand downloads. BioBuilds, which is a channel similar to Bioconda, but not quite the same standard, less than a thousand. And it looks like there is a Faircloth lab out there who've got their own channel and they've written their own package for an older version, 1.0, and there's only 22 downloads. So you can see that by having this tool in Bioconda, there is exponentially more downloads of the tool. Building recipes for Bioconda is just like building recipes for Conda with a few additional requirements and steps. Um, but some of these requirements do. Do use a stable URL. Um, so don't use a Git URL with tags. Make sure if you're using Git, use a Git release or use an actual uh, URL. Don't include a Windows build. Um, in fact, it will fail if you include a Windows build because Bioconda does not support Windows. Do include a hash. This ensures um, reliability that the file that you download is the file that you intended when you wrote the recipe. If the person who owns that URL changes the file, the hash will change and the recipe will fail. Don't include unnecessary comments. This is a quality of life thing. It just makes things too hard to read. Do include adequate tests. Um, this is to make sure that even if it builds and installs correctly, that the tool will work. Don't push inappropriate recipes. So again, Bioconda is just for bioinformatics and bio biological science related software. So if you built a fancy new database tool, which isn't specifically focused for those areas, you might want to look at pushing it to bio to Condor Forge instead. Do check that the license of the software allows redistribution. This is especially important if you're if you're wrapping um, other people's programs. 
and do check that they don't already exist because otherwise you're just doubling down. If a recipe exists, um, then it's much more preferred to update the existing recipe rather than submit a new one. Do include all the various metadata we talked about. And again, don't use Git um, URLs. Uh, Tom, it's just Jeff here. I'm so, coming up to 30 minutes, so I just thought I'd let you know. Thank you. Um, so quickly then, we'll go through how to set up a Conjure environment. We go to their GitHub, the URLs at the top, and these slides will be available afterwards. From there, you can fork it into your personal um, Git account. On your computer, you clone it, Git clone. We add the original Fireconda as an upstream remote. And then we create a new branch for the recipe for the tool you want to write a recipe for. Um, so earlier this week, one of the labs I helped out with wanted me to wrap Parsnip. Um, I checked Anaconda. It wasn't already in Bioconda or any other channels, so we passed the first check. I went to their website, and they have some pre-compiled versions, so they've made it even easier. So what I've done is I check out my Parsnip branch, and I've written the files. So here in my meta file, I've got different versions for source for Linux and OS X. I, when I have the requirements, it only needs Zlib because it's pre-compiled, and then the metadata. Again, because it's pre-compiled, it really is quite easy. I just extract it and copy it into the binary. But because it's pre-compiled, I'm going to do an extended test with run test sh and I'm using some test data they gave. Um, to actually build it on your personal local instance, you need to go, you need to install Conda build and instructions on how to do this are here. Um, and that's great for testing to begin with, but to submit to Bioconda, you need more stringent testing they offer two different ways to go about this, using a local client for Circle CI or using their included Bioconda utilities. So the easiest way, the easiest method to do this is with Circle CI. You install it using the first command. And then that means that from the base directory, we can just go Circle CI build. It requires Docker. Uh, install Docker, install the latest image, and test it. As you can see, it does take a bit of time to go through all of it. But when it passes, you can go to Bioconda, um, make a pull request. Their Circle CI will test it, and then if it passes, they review it. So this is me committing it. This is my pull request which failed, it didn't fail, um, but they did want some additional information. And I now have the latest version with all checks passed. Um, so that's the introduction to Conda and Bioconda. I would like to acknowledge a workshop earlier this year, which was held by Simon, Saskia and Eric down in Melbourne, and Andrew, again from uh, Monash, um, for some of his slides. But for further information on today's topics, do check out the Conda Guide for Building Packages and the Bioconda Guide for contrib Contributing. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, if you can just maybe share your, uh, turn your webcam on now. Um, and if the audience, if you have any questions, please type them into the questions pod, which is um, in the GoToWebinar panel. I'll just turn on my webcam as well. We should both be able to um, So whilst we're waiting for some questions from the audience, I guess I have a couple of uh, pretty basic questions. Um, so the first of these is, 
to me, this looks like it's completely revolutionized tool um, compilation for various environments. So as far as your personal, you know, how you operate, do you, is this now your preferred way of operating or do you ever do anything in a different way? Oh, oh definitely. I, I used to use Brew, um, but I had issues with conflicting packages and versioning. Um, and one of my projects from last year was with a lab was to help them get their software under control. And to do that, we took all of their user installed software, their system installed software, various people's brew environments, and we could consolidate it down into about four different conjure environments. They're available for everyone. And we've actually been able to export it to a high performance computing cluster so that they can build tools on their personal computer using these environments and then they can send them off to a cluster and that same exact environment is there. Great. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in. So uh, the first one is, it says, in the uh, meta YAML file, can you please explain what's the difference between build and run sections? Hmm. Um, so when you're building it, uh, one thing I'm, I did skip over is that it will build it on the system and then it actually um, archives it to a table and that's what gets submitted. So when you're building something, the dependencies you need will be different than when you're running something. So if we're running a, a G++ um, program, would need to have GCC installed. But to run it, you don't need that. Obviously, we want to keep our environments installed at the endpoint as small as possible. So anything you don't need for running, but you do need for building, goes into build. Um, or these days, it rather, it goes into host. OK, excellent. Thank you. Um, Got another question here. It says, I'm a bit naive, but I was wondering about how Docker containers are different to Conda environments for reproducibility. Yeah, um, and that's a great question. One of the nifty things about Bioconda is that I actually will make a Docker image for every recipe that gets submitted to it and approved. So you could just use those Docker images instead. But with Conda, you can mix and match. So on your own computer, without the additional overhead of running Docker containers, you can have these tools available. Um, and a well-written Conda recipe will take into account various cro cross-platform libraries and dependencies. So you, you shouldn't have any conflict. OK, great. Um, and we got one uh, time for one last question, and I, and I think you should probably be careful before answering it. So this person says, "Are you willing to help troubleshoot people's Bioconda recipe writing in Australia?" Uh, I think the appropriate place to post that to begin with would be with Bioconda, but certainly do get in contact um, with QFab because we do offer our services um, to help Queensland universities. And there are um, institutions similar to us around Australia. Fantastic. And I think it's also worth mentioning that Emble ABR as a national network is a really good uh, vehicle to have these conversations. So um, I think that's that's fantastic. So yes, um, you can, you know, through the, through the Emble ABR network be able to provide um, advice to people with various nodes. All right, great. So um, so if you can just unshare your screen now, Tom, I will share mine. Uh, okay, so, um, so thanks, Tom, for uh, delivering that webinar. It was fantastic. And thanks to everyone in the audience for attending today's webinars. So if you have any questions um, about uh, the webinar series and suggestions for future topics, um, please get in touch with us at this email that's shown here, webinars at embleabr.org.au. Um, 
And our next webinar will be focused on our key area of training. So this will happen on the 21st of August when we'll be hearing from Professor Rochelle Trachtenberg. Um, she's based in Georgetown University in Washington and she's a member of the Ember ABR International Science Advisory Group. And she's going to be asking how effective is short-term training through workshops, boot camps, et cetera, in providing discernible differences between uh, bioinformatics students who did and who did not attend such um, training events. I think that'll be quite interesting. And she's going to discuss how adults learn and common design characteristics of both short and longer training opportunities. She's going to examine some lessons from education, from cognitive science, and from the data and software carpentries and how these lessons can be applied to any adult learning experience. Um, so if you're interested in attending that, please visit our webinars webpage. So the uh, URL is here, emblabr.org.au slash webinars. And there's a registration link on that page. Um, so today's webinar has been recorded um, and the slides from Tom and the recording will be available next week. And we'll send an email to everyone who attended um, to provide those uh, to provide those links. Um, so finally, um, we'd just like to acknowledge some funders who make this webinar series possible. So Embel ABR would like to acknowledge funding from Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne. And AIDC would like to acknowledge funding from NCRIS. Um, as this webinar closes, there's just gonna be a short survey. It'll only take a minute, um, so please fill that out. It's a really great opportunity for you to suggest future topics. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and thanks, Tom, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Goodbye.